stuff and let's check out what's going on inside of the field. What's up, Mike? Ooh, we got parts back from machining. So this is all the two-way stuff. We use all these components to put the reservoirs together. It's a lot of good stuff, Mike. Now we got to put it all together. Oh, yeah. You ready to build Getting a bunch busy. of two-way stuff or what? Heck yeah. Let me give you a little rundown on uh, how a two-way shock works. Here's the compression adjuster. The rebound adjuster still remains at the top like a normal one-way shock. But now inside of the two-way shock, there's actually a one-way valve inside of here that only allows you to adjust rebound while you're turning this knob. On a one-way shock, on our one-way shocks, this knob adjusts rebound and a little bit of compression. But on a two-way shock, we divorce the two completely. So here's what the reservoir looks like. There's nitrogen on one side of the reservoir, shock fluid on the other side, and there's actually a dividing piston that floats up and down. So as the shock shaft enters the shock body, that fluid gets displaced into the reservoir, it pushes the dividing piston up, compresses the nitrogen chamber that's inside of there. Here's how the reservoir connects to the bottom of the shock. This is a banjo fitting, but what's cool, it's a Goodridge banjo fitting that's made in USA, super high quality, and it actually swivels. So you can move this thing all around. It floats on two O-rings, and it, we have really good success with this thing being durable. That line goes right into the reservoir. So what happens is when the fluid enters the reservoir, it goes through this port right here. Inside of there, there's a clicker adjustment assembly. There's actually a shim stack as well. The oil has to flow through that shim stack, and that's a proprietary shim stack. It slows down the oil flow. Basically, um, you take the mechanical energy, it turns it into heat by flowing through orifices that are inside of this piston. When the shock fluid enters, into the, sh the reservoir itself, after it gets past the adjuster assembly, which creates compression force, it flows in there. There's a dividing piston that's inside of this thing. The dividing piston then moves down, allowing space for the fluid to enter. On the very end of the reservoir, there's a nitrogen cap. This thing's charged with a, a needle, actually. Uh, we charge it with nitrogen, and it, it compresses the nitrogen allowing the fluid to displace. The reason you have nitrogen on the back side is because you want a consistent amount of back pressure inside of the shock. If you don't have back pressure, what happens is on the rebound stroke, this piston would not be forced back in and it wouldn't force the shock fluid to go back into the shock. You would actually cavitate. So if you don't have nitrogen pressure or enough, enough pressure, you'll have a shock that is cavitating. The more aggressively the shock is valved, the more nitrogen pressure you need in order to prevent it from cavitating. So one of the big no-nos that a lot of the cheaper two-way shocks have, well, there's a ton of big no-nos, but one of the big no-nos that we've seen is they don't actually have a check valve in, built inside of this. So as you restrict flow on the compression side, it restricts flow on the rebound side to replenish the shock with shock fluid, and that causes big major cavitation issues. So you could actually hear it, actually in this one it's kind of hard to hear, but there's a check valve built into there, so it allows fluid on the rebound side to replenish the shock quickly without cavitating the shock. So that's a really general rundown of a two-way shock, how it works, and um, this technology is what we've been using on a lot of drift kits, road race kits, and even some street cars are starting to turn to it because it's so adjustable. And